Creation and evolution. Does it matter what we believe? Our topics for this talk will be this. The two models of history. What does the model of creation teach? What does the model of evolution teach? Then we're going to do seven biblical truths and why it matters what we believe. Then science and why it matters what we believe. Then we'll bring it back to the original question, why it matters what we believe. Let's start with the creation model. The creation model teaches that in the beginning, God created everything in six days. Now, notice they use the word day there. Why do I do that? That is because that is the exact same word God used, and I'm not going to change his word here. The Bible also teaches that there was no death before sin. It also teaches there was a worldwide flood, and we'll examine that flood both biblically and geologically. Then the Bible also teaches that we were created in the image and likeness of God. So the Bible teaches God created all things. Now, the evolution model teaches something very different. It starts off like this. About 15 billion years ago, this universe exploded itself into existence out of nothing. Then about 4.5 billion years ago, this earth and solar system evolved into existence all by natural processes, and God had nothing to do with it. Then about 3.5 billion years ago, the first living cell climbed up out of that mythical primordial soup. Now, I use the word mythical there, not to be facetious, but from a scientific point of view, it's one of the only words we can use because it's never been found. And then finally, the evolution model teaches that we were not made in the image and likeness of God, but we evolved from ape-like creatures. So one model teaches God created all things. The other model teaches all we need are time chance, and natural processes. Now, we're going to lay the biblical foundation here. We're going to talk about what does the Bible teach about creation. And I want to lay three ground rules for doing any biblical interpretation here. Three rules will be this. Number one, let's not take anything out of context to support our personal ideas. Number two, let's let Scripture support Scripture where it does. And rule number three, let's not let our personal experiences interpret the Bible. We will start with the Bible. So part one, the Bible and why it matters. We're going to go through seven biblical evidences why it matters what we believe. And I'm going to lay a theme through here, and the theme will be this. Can we combine evolution and the Bible, as so many churches and Christian schools are teaching today? Another way of saying that is, did God use evolution as part of his creative process? So let's go to part one. Number one, the process for creation. The evolution model again teaches that all we need are time, chance, and natural processes. God had nothing to do with it. But what about the Bible? What does the Bible teach about how everything came into existence? Why well, are people in churches making statements like this? Well, Mike, Mike, let's not get into all this creation evolution controversy. It's really not that important. You see, God could have created any way he wanted to. Let's not put him in a box. See, we believe that God created, but you know, they go on to say, the Bible really doesn't teach how God created. Therefore, it's open to our interpretation or opinions. Now, part of what they say is true. God did create, and God could have created any way he wanted to. It's the last part they get absolutely wrong. Because, see, the Bible does teach how God created. In the first chapter of Genesis, we see the phrase, and God said over seven times. Over seven times, it teaches how God created. He's spoken into existence by his great power. We can turn to Psalm 33, 6 and 9. We see the phrase, by the word of the Lord. Right there again, it teaches how God created. He spoke it into existence. Even the New Testament teaches how God created. Hebrews 11:3 reads, through faith, we understand the world's refrained by the Word of God, so that things which are seen were not made out of the things which do appear. Over and over again, the Bible teaches how God created. And it is not open to our interpretation. It is not open to our opinions. But I know that's hard for us to understand how you can get something from nothing, because all we have is about three pounds up here. And we're a created being, and he's God, we're not, and he commanded us to accept it by faith. Now, equally important about the process is what the Bible does not teach. Absolutely nowhere in the Bible does it teach that God used evolution. Also, nowhere in the Bible does it teach that God used long periods of time for his creation. It always uses the word day. Can we combine evolution and the Bible? Not according to the process. They are completely opposite. Well, let's go to evidence number two then. 
the order of events. Can we combine evolution in the Bible for the order everything came into existence? Well, the evolution model teaches that stars evolved first, then over long periods of time, the earth evolved into existence. But the Bible clearly teaches that God made the earth first, and on day four, he made the stars. That means we have a difference in the order of events, making these two models incompatible. We turn to reptiles and birds. The evolution model teaches that reptiles evolved first, then over long periods of time, the birds evolved into existence. But the Bible clearly teaches God made the birds first, and on day six, he made the reptiles. Again, we have a difference in the order of events. And then we just turn to the earth itself. The evolution model teaches this earth started as a fiery mass. But the Bible teaches it started with water. These two models are completely opposite. You know, there's only two ways we could have gotten here. Either we evolved or we were created. And I make that statement and people say, Mike, Mike, you're being awful narrow-minded. There are other ways we could have gotten here. And my response to that is, Name one. I have never had anybody name a third possible way we could have gotten here. Either we evolved or we were created. And these two models are completely opposite. What that means is one of them is right and the other one is wrong. It also means there's no gray area now to bring evolution to the Bible because once you bring evolution to the Bible, then we have to change God's order of events, and who does that make us then? Well, let's go to evidence number three then, the cause of physical death. Can we combine the two models on the physical death? Well, the evolution model teaches that death is nothing more than a natural process. It's been going on for billions of years, ever since that first cell climbed up out of that mythical primordial soup. But you know, the Bible teaches just the opposite. Romans 5, 12, 1 Corinthians 15 teach that death came through one man. It is not a natural process. Oh, but Mike, I hear Adam and Eve didn't physically die when they fell. Therefore, physical death was not the punishment for sin. The Bible's only talking about spiritual death. Wrong. The Bible makes it very clear here that it's talking about both physical and spiritual death. What happened at the fall? God took Adam and Eve and placed them out of the garden. He even put an angel there, a sentry there, to make sure they could not get back into the garden. Why? Because the Bible makes this statement, that if they could have stayed in the garden, they could have eaten from the tree of life and lived forever. That word forever is right there in the Bible. The Bible is very clear. The punishment for sin was both physical and spiritual death. Now I'm going to make a, a statement here. Now I'm going to make a biblical statement. And think about this. Think about this. God has just finished his six days of creation. He looks back on his entire creation and makes this statement. Everything looks sort of good. No, that's not what the Bible really teaches. But you know, many churches are teaching that today. Because the Bible teaches that when God finished his creation, he called it very good. And that Hebrew word for very can also mean exceedingly. He called his creation exceedingly good. So where does this sort of good come from that many churches are teaching today. Even many Christian schools are teaching that God's creation was sort of good. Well, here's where it comes from. From people believing that this earth is billions of years old. And what we need to understand is all the science, if not all the science today, clearly teaches that the earth is really young. We just don't see that in our textbooks today because it's been censored out. But for people believing this earth is billions of years old, then what was going on for those billions of years before Adam and Eve came on board? The answer would be billions of years of death and decay because that's what the fossil record is. It's a record of dead things. Now picture this. God looks back on billions of years of death and decay and pronounces that very good you see, if God's very good means billions of years of death and decay, then what else does it mean in the Bible when God calls something good? And how good is heaven going to be if his very good is death and decay? Now, where's the first occurrence of any death in the Bible? Any death at all. Any animal death. Not until after the fall. There's absolutely no mention anywhere in the Bible of any death until after the fall. 
But what about plants? What were Adam and Eve eating from? Plants. What happens when we dig up plants and we eat them? We kill them. Does that mean there was now death before sin? Well, before we make any opinions, I need to make a statement here. I believe Adam and Eve were eating from every kind of plant except one. There's only one kind of plant I don't believe Adam and Eve were eating from. And that plant is Brussels sprouts, because I don't think they came till after the fall. Now, I just want to make sure you understand something there. That's an opinion. It's a strong opinion, because I haven't found it in the Bible yet. Now, what about death before sin? When we dig up plants and we eat them, we kill them. Does that really mean there was death now? Well, again, before we make opinions, we need to read and study God's Word. In the Bible, it teaches that God breathed the breath of life into humans. In Genesis chapter 7, it also teaches that God had breathed the breath of life into animals, but nowhere in the Bible does he breathe the breath of life into plants. Also, nowhere in the Bible will you see a plant directly die. They wither and fade, but never directly die. Was there any death before sin? Not according to the Bible. Again, just the opposite of evolution. Well, let's go to evidence number four then, the Genesis flood. Can we combine the two models on the flood? Well, the evolution model teaches that the flood was nothing more than a myth or maybe some local regional flood somewhere. And I'm going to add this. For those of us who are believing this earth is billions of years old, whether we know it or not, we are believing the exact same thing the evolution model teaches, that the flood was either a myth, meaning it never happened, or maybe just some local stream flood somewhere. Because you cannot have an old earth and a worldwide flood. The two will not go together. Why is that? Well, it has to do with the fossil record. See, evolutionists use certain types of fossils called index fossils, the index into the geologic strata that determine the many different ages of earth history. For example, if we were to find a trilobite fossil, those, those creatures may be about an inch long to over a foot long that walk on the ocean floors. If we were to find a trilobite fossil, we immediately know the sediments we found it in are about 500 million years old, because that's what evolutionists believe trilobites lived, died, and would have been buried. If we were to find a Tyrannosaurus rex fossil, we'd immediately know the sediments we found it in are about 80 million years old, because that's when evolutionists believe Tyrannosaurus rexes lived, died, and would have been buried. So you see they're using these index fossils to index into the strata, determining many different geologic ages of Earth history. But if there was a worldwide flood, when would most all those creatures have been buried? And the answer is, at the same time. And if they're all buried at the same time, that means they all point to one time period in Earth history, not many different geologic ages. So we can't have it both ways. It's not logical to have an old earth and a worldwide flood. So what we need to do now is go to the Bible and see what does the Bible teach about the flood. Well, a brief overview goes like this. Forty days and forty nights the floodgates of heaven came down. The springs of the deep were bursting forth, and all land-breathing creatures perished except those on the ark. And the waters covered the highest hills, the mountains, by at least 20 feet. Now that sounds like a description of a flood we have never witnessed. We've never seen anything close to that description. So now let's apply a little science and logic to this description. If I were to take a glass of water here and pour it on a table, what happens to that water? Well, that water hits that table and begins to spread out and spread out. And it will continue to spread until something stops it. Now, why doesn't that water stay there in a nice, neat little pile when I pour it out? Well, one of the answers is called gravity. See, gravity is exerting a force in that water, causing it to spread and spread. Now, let's go back to the description of the flood. Forty days and forty nights, the floodgates of him. The springs of the deep are bursting forth. And gravity is exerting a force on that water, causing it to spread and spread until something stops it. But guess what? There is nothing there to stop it because the Bible teaches the waters cover the highest hills by at least 20 feet. That means this cannot be a local flood unless we don't believe in gravity. 
And if anyone here tonight does not believe in gravity, you come forth and we'll use you as a test case. You see, when we fully understand science, it always agrees with God's word. Now, some more logic here. If you want to make this a local flood, then how do we explain why Noah had to have over 100 years to build an ark when all he had to do was go to another land and be safe? If you want to make this a local flood, how do you explain why God had to bring two of every land-breathing creature to that ark, including the birds, when they would have been safe where they were at? See, it becomes very hard to understand God's message to us when we begin adding outside information into his word called evolution. Then we can turn to Genesis chapter 9. In Genesis chapter 9, God is making a covenant, and he calls this an everlasting covenant, and it goes like this. Never again will I destroy the world by this type of flood. Well, if you want to make this a local or regional flood, have we had local floods since then? And the answer is yes. We've had devastating floods throughout the world. But then how are we to understand God's everlasting covenant when he said he would never do that again? See, I believe the only thing that is consistent with God's covenant is a worldwide flood, because we've never had one since then, nor will we ever have one again. Now the question comes. Is there any geologic evidence to support there was once a worldwide flood? And the answer to that is, you betcha. Don't you like science terms? They're easy to understand. You know what we find on top of just about every mountain range on this planet? Marine fossils. Seashells. Do you know what we don't find with those seashells? Legs. You know what that means? They did not walk up there. We go down to other areas, South America, we find whale fossils in the mountains down there. You know what we don't find with those whale fossils? Legs. And we know what that means. They did not walk up there either. How did all these marine fossils get so high up in the mountains all over this planet? Well, there's one explanation, and everybody agrees with it. And that is at some point in time in the history of this earth, all those mountains had to be covered with ocean water. Now, we know the mountains weren't always this tall. We have good scientific evidence of very rapid mountain growth. But then, how did that water get above the mountains? Well, there are two explanations. One, you can go to the Bible, read the Genesis account of the flood, where it says it covered the highest hills of the mountains by at least 20 feet of water. Or you can go to the evolution story, which teaches that over long periods of time, the continents sank and they came back up. And they sank and came back up. But the question I have for anybody believing that is, did anybody ever observe that? And the answer is no. But did you know there's over 200 legends from cultures all over this planet of a flood, but not one of the evolution model? Also, all over this planet, we find fossil graveyards. Graveyards where we find thousands of creatures all buried and fossilized together. Now, hold on. First of all, how do you become a fossil? Well, one thing we know for sure is you don't fall over dead and become a fossil. You must be buried rapidly by the sediments to keep the oxygen out and the scavengers away. So then how do you get thousands of creatures all buried and fossilized together? Well, one thing we know for sure about that is not by long, slow processes, which rules out most of the evolution model. It takes a catastrophic event to do that. And we find these all over this planet, which is consistent with a worldwide flood. Now some more geology. May 18th, 1980. Something very significant happened in the state of Washington called Mount St. Helens, a volcano. May 18th, 1980, at 8.32 in the morning, an earthquake of magnitude 5.1 struck that mountain, Mount St. Helens. At that point in time, the largest observed landslide in history took place. The entire side of that mountain slid down into Spirit Lake, causing a water wave to go about 800 feet high on the other side of the mountain, washing down thousands of trees back down into the lake. Following all that came the pyroclastic flows, hot gas and ash coming down that mountain about 70 miles an hour at over 800 degrees. 
Following that came the mud flows from all the snow and the ice at the top melting, all the vapor coming out of the mountain. Mud flows coming down that mountain about 50 miles an hour with such force, some of these mud flows went almost 20 miles beyond the mountain. And what was the result of all of this? Well, before I talk about the results, I want to talk about how large canyons are formed. And to find that out, we can open up our textbooks. And the typical explanation in our textbooks goes something like this. We have to have rivers running through there for hundreds of thousands or millions of years. And we might have to have some geologic movement such as earthquakes going through there. But you know there's only one problem with that explanation. It's mostly just a story we find in textbooks. Because this canyon we're looking at here is nicknamed the Little Grand Canyon by Mount St. Helens. It's 1 40th the scale model of the Grand Canyon. It has some of the same geologic formations we find in the Grand Canyon. Now this canyon is very deep and extends for long distances. And the question I have is, how long did it take to make this canyon? And the answer is, one day. Oh, come on, Mike, how do you know this only took one day? Well, that's easy. See, one day it was not there, and the next day it was. You know what that means? We have observable evidence that large canyons can and do form rapidly. We have the observable evidence to support that. Now, here's another area in the state of Washington. In eastern Washington, there's an area called the Scablands. It's a large, barren area, not much there. Just solid rock. In some places, this rock is almost a thousand feet deep. And carved all through this solid rock are many channels and canyons like you see here. Some of these canyons are over 500 feet deep and extending for miles. And the question we have is, how long did it take to make these canyons? And the answer is, just weeks. The Missoula flood came through there and carved these canyons out through solid rock rapidly. You can go to any university bookstore today, pick out their geology textbook, and every single one of them today will say these canyons were formed by a catastrophic event. The power of water to create large geologic structures rapidly is well known. Then we can turn to other geologic processes. We look at the sides of canyon walls. And we see all them down these canyon walls are made up of many thin layers. Sometimes these layers are only millimeters thick. And the normal interpretation we see is each one of these layers took a season or year or years to lay down. So if you were to look at this canyon here and count up all those layers, you would assume this canyon must be tens of thousands of years old, and your answer would be absolutely wrong. See, this canyon by Mount St. Helens was formed in one day in 1982 as those pyroclastic flows came down off that mountain along with the mud flows they sorted out the sediments into thin layers rapidly the requirement for long ages is not there but that's not the only way we get thin layers of sedimentation during earthquakes there's a process called liquefaction that's when we have an earthquake in an area where we have underground water underground springs Sometimes that water will swell up to the surface, turning the ground into quicksand, and buildings will literally sink into the ground. And when that water settles back down, it sorts out the sediments into thin layers rapidly. Where is this requirement for long ages coming from? Not from the Bible, not even from science. It's only coming from a model called evolution. But those aren't the only ways we get thin layers of sedimentation laid down. The geologists today agree that over 50% of the Earth's sedimentation, over 50% was laid down by underwater landslides called turbidites. Now, wait a minute. What would cause so many underwater landslides? Well, just a thought here. How about a worldwide flood? It seems to match the data. It's been observed that these underwater landslides, these turbidites, have laid down tens of thousands of square miles. Not feet, not yards, but tens of thousands of square miles of thin layers of sediment in a matter of hours. Where is this need for long ages coming from now? Not from science, not from the Bible. It's only coming from a model called evolution. Then we can turn to a strange fossil 
called a polystrate fossil. Now, what is a polystrate fossil? Well, before I talk about a polystrate fossil, I want to talk about coal. How is coal formed? Well, again, we can turn to our textbooks. Now, one of the things you notice I like to do in a lot of my talks is I tend to pick on textbooks. Now, why do I do that? The answer is easy. They deserve it. Now, how is coal formed? Well, our typical explanation is, first of all, we've got to start with swamp vegetation. Then we're going to have long periods of time for that swamp vegetation to gradually decay and mix with other minerals and elements. Then we're going to have more long periods of time for it to slowly decay and turn into peat. Then we're going to have more long periods of time for that peat to slowly harden and turn into coal. And there's only one problem with that explanation. It's just a story we find in textbooks. Because, you see, all over this planet, we find polystrate fossils. Those are tree fossils. Poly meaning many, strata, straight strata, many strata. Tree fossils spanning many seams of strata, specifically in coal beds, many seams of coal. Now here's the situation. If that coal took hundreds of thousands or millions of years to form, none of those trees would be there. They'd have all rotted in just years. But yet, there they are, observable evidence that that coal had to form rapidly. You know what else we discovered about these polystrate fossils, these fossils spanning many seams of coal? They did not grow there. We look at the root structures, they're not there. The sediments around them show they did not grow in the coal. Well, if they didn't grow in the coal, then how did they get there? Well, to understand that, we can go back to Mount St. Helens. Remember that water wave that washed many thousands of trees down into the lake? When the eruption was all over, we had a log mat sitting in Spirit Lake of over a million logs, all just floating in Spirit Lake. Then we noticed some of them got waterlogged at the root end, started bobbing up and down. Then we noticed some of them started sinking down into the bottom of the lake. So rather than relying on assumptions and textbooks, we sent some scientists down to the bottom of the lake to see what was happening. And what we observed was this. The bark had fallen off those trees, mixed with other minerals and elements, and in less than 20 years, we already have a thick layer of peat down there. It was not swamp vegetation. It was the bark off the trees in less than 20 years. Now, if we get the right environment down there, the right heating conditions, maybe in another 40, 50 years, we could have a coal bed down there. And guess what will be embedded in the middle of that coal bed? Trees that did not grow there, just like we find all over the world, a testimony to a catastrophic event such as the worldwide flood. Now, how long does it really take to make coal? Well, today, simulating natural processes, we can make coal in under one week. Whoa, where's this necessity for long ages then? It's not coming from the Bible. It's not coming from science. It's only coming from a story called evolution. Well, what about oil then, Mike? Well, today, simulating natural processes, we can make oil in well under one week. It's not going to solve any energy crisis because it takes a lot of energy to do that. But the question now again is, where's this necessity for long ages that we've been indoctrinated with? Not the Bible, not science. Long ages only comes from a story called evolution. Oh, Mike, well, what about petrified wood then? Well, do you know simulating natural processes today, we can make petrified wood from wood in one week. That's all it takes. This whole idea of requiring long ages only comes from the story evolution, not from real science. Well, let's go to number five then, the creation days. This is a hard one for a lot of people, since we're talking about time. What does the evolution model have to say about time? Well, time, long ages, are the holy grail of evolution. I hear the statement, Mike, just give it enough time and it will happen. Well, I want to make sure you understand something about that statement. Give it enough time and it will happen. That statement should not be allowed in a science classroom because it is not a scientific statement. It is a faith-based statement. And we need to keep science to the science classroom. See, here's what that statement really says. We don't know how it happened, but given enough time, we have faith it will 
People, we need to keep science to the science classroom, not somebody else's religious faith called evolution. But what about the Bible? Does the Bible teach literal days, 24-hour periods? Or does it really leave room to interpret these days of creation as long and definite periods of time? Well, I'm going to preface it this way. My opinion about these days of creation does not matter. Nor does anybody else's opinion. See, the only thing that matters is, what did God have to say about his creation? So we're going to go to the Bible and see what God had to say. And we're going to start with the word day. In the Hebrew word, the Hebrew word for day is yom. Now that word yom can have several different meanings. It can mean the daylight portion of a day. It can mean a 24-hour period. It can mean some distant point in time, such as the day of the Lord, and it can have other meanings. Now if a word can have so many different meanings, how do we know what it means when we read it? The answer is called context. We must look at the context the word is used to derive the intended meaning. So let's do that. When we read through Genesis chapter 1, we read first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day. Notice there's a number used with the word day in each case there. Is that significant? It might be. Because if you go through the Old Testament, you'll see a number used with the word day about 359 times. And in every single case, it means a short period of time, a day. There are no exceptions. Now, does that prove these were literal 24-hour periods? Well, we have to be careful with the word prove. But it does show a consistency throughout God's word that everywhere in the Old Testament, he puts a number of the word day, it only means a day. But you know what God does next just to make sure we'd understand? He defines the days for us. He puts parameters around him, gives each day a definite beginning and a definite ending when he says evening and morning first day, evening and morning second day, evening and morning third day, just to make sure we'd understand. But isn't it great that God understands us? See, he knows we only have three pounds up here because he's the one that put them there. But he also understands that sometimes we might leave the house and operate off about two and a half of those pounds. So he gives us some more information. Right in the middle of the creation account, Genesis 1.14, God makes a statement that distinguishes a day from a season and a year, implying these are different lengths of time. Day, season, year, different lengths of time. So if we're going to make the days of creation a long and definite period of time, then how long is a season? Because it's got to be longer than that. And how long is a year? It's got to be longer than that too. See, the whole language falls apart when we begin bringing in outside information and add it to God's word. But isn't it great that God understands us? See, he knows we have those three pounds up here. But he also understands that sometimes we might leave that house and leave all three pounds at home. So he gives us some powerful evidence. Very powerful evidence. Exodus 20, verse 11. Now, why is this so powerful? Because now we are in the middle of the Ten Commandments, and God is writing this down himself. And he writes this down in Exodus 20, verse 11. For in Six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. Six days he wrote down. Folks, that is Scripture supporting Scripture. But wait, there's more. We do word studies. Languages have many words that can be used to indicate some form of time. For example, in the English language, we have words like second, minute, hour, day, season, year, decade, millennium, and so forth. Now, the Hebrew language also has many words that can be used to indicate some form of time. And several of these words can be used to indicate a long period of time. Now, if God would have wanted us to clearly understand that his creation took a long period of time, he could have used any one of these other Hebrew words. But he chose none of them. He specifically chose the word day. He was consistent with how he used it. He defined it for us, and he wrote it down. What more evidence do we need that God meant six literal days. And then consider this. What is the purpose of a language? See, the whole purpose of a language is to communicate. Now, whom is God trying to communicate with here in his word? Us. 
Would it make any sense at all if God specifically chose the word day, was consistent with how he used it, defined it for us, and wrote it down for us, and then intended that to mean something else like long and definite periods of time? See, if that is the way God is trying to communicate to us, how can we be sure of anything else in his word then? Then here's the test. Here's the test. Rewrite Genesis chapter 1. Rewrite Genesis chapter 1 so that everybody clearly understands that he means six literal days. What would you change? Nothing. But now, rewrite Genesis chapter 1 so that everybody would clearly understand that God meant six long periods of time. What would you change? Quite a bit. So the question is, how much clearer could God have made it? He made it plain and clear in his word, six literal days. But wait, there's more. Every language we know in the world is made up of sentences. And a lot of these languages have components that make up their sentences, such as nouns, verbs, subjects, objects, prepositions, and so forth. And some of these languages, depending on the order you put these components, that sentence can take on a different type of meaning. And the Hebrew language is one of those languages. For example, if you were to write a sentence in the Hebrew language, and you structure it such that the subject comes first, then the verb, then the object. Subject, verb, object. That is intended to be poetic style writing in the Hebrew language, such as we see in most of the Psalms. But if you were to write a Hebrew sentence and structure it such that the verb is first, then the subject, then the object. Verb, subject, object. That is narrative style writing in the Hebrew language. History, fact. Now, how is Genesis chapter 1 translated from the Hebrew language? Well, when we translate it from the Hebrew language, it really reads in this order. In the beginning, create it, God, the heavens. Created is the verb. God is the subject. Heavens is the object. That is verb, subject, object. That is narrative style writing in the Hebrew language. History, fact. Anyone making the claim that Genesis chapter 1 is just an allegory good for spiritual teaching or says it's just a poetic style writing is guilty of adding their opinions into God's word. You see, the context of the language clearly supports six literal days. The grammatical structure of the Hebrew language in Genesis chapter 1 clearly supports six literal days, narrative history. But wait, there's more. The genealogies. Oh, come on, Mike. Now you've overstepped your bounds. I have heard you can't trust these genealogies. I've heard there's missing names and gaps in there. Notice how I said that. I have heard. Very seldom is it, I have studied. It makes a big difference. But you know, when God does something, he does it perfect. Because when people make claims they can't trust the genealogies, I'll take them to three places in the Bible. Genesis chapter 5, 1 Chronicles 1, and Luke chapter 3. Because in all three places, it gives the same first ten names starting with Adam. And all we really need to do is just go to Genesis chapter 5. That'll clear it up. But again, when God does something, he does it perfect. And I've talked to Hebrew scholars. I've talked to people who know the Hebrew language well. And most of them will say there are no names missing in these first ten names. And I've talked to some other Hebrew scholars that might admit there could be a Few names missing. Now, notice how I said that. Only a few. I know of no Hebrew scholars that would make the statement that there are enough names missing in these first ten to make up for hundreds of thousands or millions of years of time. Because if there are that many names missing, then the genealogies would make no sense at all. But again, when God does something, he does it perfect. It wouldn't make any difference if there were only a few names missing here in the first ten. It wouldn't make any difference. Because when you line these first ten names up, something very interesting shows up. What we see is Adam was living at the same time as Noah's father. And Noah was living at the same time as Abraham's father, Terah. Their lifespans overlap. It wouldn't make any difference if there's any names missing. So here's what we get now when we go back and study the written records. We see that the time 
from today back to the time of Jesus Christ is about 2,000 years. We also see that the time from Jesus Christ back to Abraham is about 2,000 years. So the only time in question now is from Abraham back to Adam. And the Bible clearly teaches that is also about 2,000 years. We add all this up. We have an age of the earth about 6,000 years. And I use the word about there. It could be 6,000, might even be 7,000 years. But nowhere does the Bible teach hundreds of thousands or millions or billions of years. It is not a biblical concept. Now, is that a problem scientifically? No, it is not. Didn't we just see geologically there is no requirement for long ages? Well, let's see again what some of the Hebrew scholars have to say about time. Here's a gentleman, Professor James Barr, professor of Hebrew at the University of Oxford. Now, he's a Hebrew scholar, and he's not a Christian, but he understands the Hebrew language, and this is what he states when he reads Genesis chapter 1. Probably so far as I know, there is no professor of Hebrew or Old Testament at any world-class university who dares not believe that the writers of Genesis 1 through 11 intended to convey to the readers the ideas that creation took place in a series of six days, which are the same as the days, the 24 hours we now experience. Even non-Christians see what the Bible has to say. The Bible teaches six literal days not very long ago. And then we have Dr. Robert Cole, Ph.D. in Semitic Languages, writes this. There is nothing in the Bible to obviate the idea that the days of Genesis were 24-hour type days. Nothing in the Bible to deviate from the idea there were literally 24-hour periods. That is the overwhelming consensus of the Hebrew scholars, 24-hour periods. And then we have Robert L. Raymond, Ph.D., wrote a book called A New Systematic Theology of the Christian Faith, makes this statement about the days of creation. In the hundreds of other cases in the Old Testament, where Yom stands in conjunction with an ordinal number, such as 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, and 6th, then he gives some cases where this occurs outside the book of Genesis, such as Exodus 12, verse 15, Exodus 24, verse 16, and Leviticus 12, 3, and he concludes, it never means anything other than a normal, literal day. And finally, Douglas F. Kelly, professor of systematic theology, in his book, Creation and Change, makes this statement. And he says, to summarize, liberal scholars of both 19th and 20th centuries admit that the text of Genesis is clearly meant to be taken in a literal, historical sense, although they deny its claims to speak accurately to our space, time, cosmos. Now, here's what he's saying. Even many of the liberal scholars, when they read Genesis chapter 1, see that it means literally 24-hour periods, but some of them choose not to accept that. They choose not to believe the Bible. Why? Because their worldview starts with man's word, not with God's word. Can we combine evolution in the Bible? Not according to the days of creation. They are completely opposite. Well, let's go to evidence number six then, the origin of life. Can we combine the two models here? Well, the evolution model teaches that we are nothing more than a chance accident. They teach that to our grade school children in this country. They're just a chance accident. You know what they're being taught? They're being taught that there's no hope. They're being taught when they die, that's all there is. Do you see why we have so many problems in our school systems today? They're being taught you can do anything you want. You can bring a gun to school, shoot people, then shoot yourself, and you're being taught you're not going to be held accountable for any of your actions because they're taught that once you're dead, that's all there is. How sad it's going to be when these people stand before God and find out they were wrong and don't get a second chance. But you know, the Bible teaches just the opposite of this. The Bible teaches that God created all things. God created all life. It, creation is mentioned or implied in almost every single book of the Bible. So if you're trying to bring evolution into the Bible, it's not just the book of Genesis you're going to have to change. It's almost every single book of the Bible. It'd be a whole lot easier if you just went out and wrote your own religion book. Well, let's go to evidence number seven then. What did Jesus have to say about creation? This might make it kind of important. I hear statements like this from, from churches. My, my, 
let's not get into all this creation evolution controversy. It's really not that important. See, it's only a secondary doctrine. Just preach Jesus. Just talk about the works of Jesus. And I think that's great because Jesus Christ is the author and perfecter of our faith. And we need to keep our eyes focused on him. But folks, the world wants answers before they accept the cross. They want answers and we don't know how to give them. For example, where did Cain get his wife? How do you fit those great big dinosaurs on the ark? What about all those ancient cavemen that were millions of years ago? How did that distant starlight reach us? See, the world wants answers to those. We don't have them, so they see us as inconsistent Christians because we don't even know what we believe. And they see us as those inconsistent Christians, and they walk away before we have a chance to preach the cross. Why should they accept the cross when we don't even trust the Bible ourselves? We don't even have answers to what we believe. You see... This issue has been a major stumbling block for people seeing the cross. But you know, Jesus had something to say about this. In John chapter 5, verse 46 and 47, Jesus makes a statement. And it goes like this. Moses wrote about me. If you can't believe what Moses wrote, how will you believe what I say? Whoa! What did... Moses write down. He wrote down the book of Genesis, which contains the creation account. And here's Jesus Christ now saying, if you can't believe that, you won't believe me either. Jesus just laid Genesis as the foundation for all his works. And he even had more to say. In Matthew 23, Jesus believed Abel was a real person. In Matthew 24, Jesus believed the flood was a real event. And then in Mark 10, verse 6, Jesus makes a very profound statement. In Mark 10, verse 6, Jesus makes a statement. From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Notice he did not say after millions of years, but he said from the beginning of creation. A strong testimony from Jesus Christ that this earth is young. But now we have to ask the question. Who is Jesus Christ to make these statements? What are his credentials? How many books has he written? Well, hopefully, we know him as God who came down to this planet as a man and suffered and died on a cross, shed his blood for something we did and was raised from the dead to offer each and every one of us hope. But he is more than that. He's more than that. Because, you see, the Bible also teaches that Jesus Christ is the creator of all things. There is your tie-in. The one who went to the cross for you is the same one that called it all into existence. You deny the creation. You have now just denied the cross. And where is your faith now? It's in vain. Now, I want to do a little role play here. Just a little role play. And what I want to do here is play the role of a skeptic. And I want to be an astronomer here. Not that all astronomers are skeptics. I know some very good astronomers who believe in a six-day creation about 6,000 years ago. Why? Because one, they believe that's what the Bible teaches. And secondly, they can support it scientifically. So let me put my skeptic's hat on here for just a moment. And I'm going to make this statement. I believe that God created but you know, I cannot accept that God created everything in six days about 6,000 years ago because it's simply not scientific to believe that. Because I look out there to the cosmos, I see billions of galaxies. And each one of these galaxies contains billions of stars. And when I look at them through a telescope, they look like a pinpoint of light. I mean, these galaxies are so far out there, it would take billions of years for that light to reach us. Therefore, I cannot accept that God created everything in six days about 6,000 years ago because it's simply not scientific to believe that. Well, if that is our reasoning, we cannot accept that God created everything in six days about 6,000 years ago because we cannot accept it based on our understanding of science, then I have a very important question for us. Why do we accept the resurrection? Because it is not scientific either. You see, 
we begin picking and choosing our miracles now out of the God's word. And that's what the world sees us as, inconsistent Christians. We believe parts of it, not other parts. Do you see, do you believe that Jesus walked on water? It's not scientific. Do you believe that Jesus fed the 5,000 from a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish? It's not scientific either. Where do you get that bread and fish from? It wasn't there. We begin picking and choosing our miracles, and that's what the world sees. But you know, I believe we have a God big enough to do all of this. Jeremiah 32, 17 teaches we have a God that can do this. Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast created the heaven and the earth by thy great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for thee. The question is, is that the God we serve? Or do we need to continue picking and choosing who our God is? Do you believe that Jesus even raised Lazarus from the dead? I've never even seen a roadkill come to life. We begin picking and choosing our miracles and acting like inconsistent Christians here. We begin bringing God down to our level of understanding. We begin creating God in our image. And that is idolatry. Can we combine evolution in the Bible? Not according to any one of these seven biblical evidences. They are completely opposite. Now let's go to part two, science and why it matters what we believe. Now what I've put up here is a chart of what we call natural laws of science. Now what I mean by natural law of science is this, that everything we observe in this universe agrees with how these laws operate. And the reason I put this chart in here is because I keep hearing the statement, evolution is science, creation is religion. Now is that a true statement? Well, let's find out. Let's go through these four natural laws of science for which there's no known objections. And let's start with the first law of thermodynamics, which teaches this. The total sum of all the matter and energy in this universe is constant. It is not being created, nor is it being destroyed. Matter and energy might change forms, but the total sum stays in existence. The first law also teaches this. The universe could not have created itself. That begs the question then to the evolutionists, where did the original matter and energy come from? And the answer I get a lot of times is, let's not talk about that, Mike. Let's talk about something else. It doesn't have anything to do with evolution. Yes, it does. If you can't tell me where your matter came from, don't even begin to talk to me about biological change. It's the whole foundation for your model. You can't do anything without your matter and energy. But evolution has no scientific answer for where this matter and energy originated from. And the evolution model does not allow for faith. It is called a materialistic model. Naturalism does not allow for any supernatural. So they have no scientific answer, do not allow for faith. Therefore, they have no answer and contradict this law. But what about the Bible? Well, the Bible begins with, in the beginning, God created, and we accept that by faith. So we at least have a reasonable answer. It's by faith, but it is a reasonable answer. So the Bible agrees with this first law of thermodynamics. Then we can go to the second law of thermodynamics, which teaches this. Energy goes from a state of usable energy to a state of less usable energy for doing work in an isolated system. What that is teaching is that over time, everything's losing its available energy for doing work. In other words, the correlation would be from complexity to less complexity. Everything is decaying over time. The easiest way to say that is everything's going south. Where the first law taught the universe could not have created itself, the second law implies the universe had to have a beginning. And what does the evolution model teach? That over time, everything's gaining in information and complexity. Just the opposite of the second law. Evolution clearly contradicts this law. But what about the Bible? You know the Bible almost teaches the second law of thermodynamics? What happened at the fall? God placed a curse, decay. Romans 8.22 teaches all creation groaneth. The Bible teaches the entire creation is in decay, exactly the second law. So the Bible agrees with this law, evolution contradicts it. Then we have the law of cause and effect, which teaches for every effect, there has to be an equal to or greater than cause. Every effect has to have a cause. 
That begs this question then, what caused that mythical ball of matter to suddenly start expanding called the Big Bang Explosion? And the answer I get a lot of times is, oh, Mike, let's not talk about that. It doesn't have anything to do with evolution. Yes, it does. Because I open up these biology textbooks, I open up these astronomy textbooks, and every one of them I see the Big Bang. Folks, that is an effect. And if you're going to put an effect in a science textbook, we have the right to ask, what was the cause, and if you can't explain the cause, then we need to take it out of the textbook and put it into a philosophy classroom where it belongs. We need to keep science to the science classrooms, not faith and philosophy. So the evolution model has no answer to this question. But the Bible starts off with, in the beginning, God created, and we accept that by faith again, so we have a reasonable answer. So the Bible agrees with this law, evolution contradicts it. Then we have the law of biogenesis, which teaches that life only comes from life. Why is that a natural law? Because that is all we've ever observed. No known exceptions. And what are they teaching in our biology classrooms? That three and a half billion years ago, folks, chemicals evolved into a living cell. That, folks, is scientifically impossible. So evolution clearly contradicts this natural law of science. But what does the Bible teach? That in the beginning, God, a living being, created all life. The Bible agrees with every one of these natural laws. Evolution contradicts everyone. So let's go back to that original statement. Evolution is science, creation is religion. Is that a true statement? No, it is not. Both models must ultimately rely on faith. But there's a difference between our faith. See, in the Bible, we have miracles. We recognize we have a God of miracles. We have a miracle maker, so we have a reasonable faith. The evolution model clearly requires miracles, but they have no miracle maker. That is called a blind faith. Which faith would you rather have then? A reasonable faith or a blind faith? Here's another statement I commonly hear. Mike, the battle is between science and the Bible. No, it is not. Who created all the science? God did. Is he in a battle with himself? No. You see, the real battle is between evolution and the Bible. And you can also add the battles between evolution and science because they're not the same thing either. So we need to get our story straight. The battle is not between science and the Bible. We believe real science. What we don't accept is the philosophy of evolution. So, down to the final statement here. Why it matters what we believe. Let's go back to Genesis 1.31. What does it mean when God calls his entire creation very good? Does it mean death and decay? Because if it does, then who is the author of death? Not sin, but God himself. What does it mean in Exodus 20, verse 11, when God writes down himself in the Ten Commandments that he created everything in six days? Does he not remember what he did? And what does it mean in John chapter 5, verse 46 and 47, when Jesus Christ says, Moses wrote about me. If you can't believe what Moses wrote, how will you believe what I say? See, he put Genesis as the foundation for all our Christian doctrines. How can you go out and tell anybody that marriage is between one man and one woman if you don't take Genesis as true history? You have no right to do that. How can you go out and tell anybody about sin if Genesis is not true history? How can you talk about the cross without Genesis as true history? Because it's the foundation for every one of our Christian doctrines. It is the whole reason why Jesus Christ had to go to the cross. But then what have been the effects of all this evolution teaching? One of the main reasons our youth are leaving the church today is they cannot defend a belief in the Bible. I go to Sunday schools all over this country, specifically high school Sunday schools, and ask them questions, and they can't defend a belief in the Bible. I go to adult Sunday schools, and they can't do it either. What does that say about Christian education in this country then? When we have people been in Sunday school classes for 12, 14, 15 years and still can't defend a belief in the Bible. But it gets worse than that. The studies have now shown that we are losing 70%. 70% of our students are leaving the church after high school because of this issue. 70%.
Because no one ever taught them. And what does that state now? What that means is this. Any church that does not see this as a critical issue is really saying this. They are not concerned with 70% of their youth. So what are they concerned with? Well, this is what we have observed across this country that many churches are concerned with. Specifically, the high school level. Bringing in the numbers so we look good on paper and then entertaining them like the world. That is what we see predominantly across this country. Now, I'm not saying entertainment's bad, but when it becomes the main focus so that you can keep the numbers in there, that is why we are losing 70% of our youth today. So what can be done about all this? The Bible teaches what can be done. Right out of 1 Peter 3.15, where it states, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, what does 1 Peter 3.15 mean? Well, it means this. We must understand what we believe. We must understand why we are Christians. And here's the part we fail to recognize. We must be able to articulate what we believe, which means we have to have a ready answer.